Cardinal Gibbons. Gotcha. I will take care of that. And Sean Tom Bojarski from Serta, Charlotte. For whatever reason, I can't edit the uh, sign in. Uh, interesting. You should be able to because it's open to anyone with the link, but I'll take care of it. And you said Serta, Charlotte? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Let's get started. Uh, so, uh, PID Zone registration opened up for our student athletes on Saturday. And as of the last time I um, looked at everything, we were 58 teams registered and 182 licensed coaches. That's 51 female and 131 male. And we have 104 riders that are registered, 42 high school and 62 middle school. So we're off to a really great start. Uh, my prediction is that this 58 will be 60 plus uh, here in the next two weeks or so. And this 104 will be 900 by January 31st. So we will see how accurate my predictions are. All right. Uh, that's where it's at from Gotham Steel. Are you tired of pants that burn and lids that don't care? A set for nightmare to clean. You need a new set, but prices are so high it's obscene. Well, now there's a brand new professional cookware set that's ultra durable and non-stick. These pants are super slick. All right. So, um... We will keep going. So important dates. We've got, of course, November 1st. That's the last day to register a team for the $20 fee. So I know um, some teams have not gotten in there and registered yet. So just want to make this point very obvious for everyone that it does go up to $140 afterwards, not $120. It's a $120 increase to $140. Uh, big news, November 19th and 20th League Summit. And I have a link here for the event registration and lodging discount information. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Brian, our league director, you would like to probably make a plug at this point on getting registered for this. Yeah, I certainly would. Thanks, Sean. I think there's two kind of practical aspects of registering as early as possible. One is uh, just maximizing the lodging discount, depending on which hotel I've listed in Eventbrite. Um, I think the group rate goes away the end of October or early November, depending on which hotel you're going with. I'm going to add one more hotel I just locked in today, True by Hilton, and I think they're going to give us till about 4 November for the group discount code. And then the second aspect is in order to confirm and guarantee your League Summit t-shirt size and color, you need to have those sizes and colors in by the end of October so really be helpful if everyone signs up as early as possible for League Summit, uh, really by the end of October, to help us out with all the numbers. All right, uh, so sign up early and often for the League Summit. The League Summit will be worth eight CEUs. Uh, those of you that are in need of CEUs, uh, it will be a nice boost. Others of you that have CEUs, remember that those expire on, um, calendar years. So every three years, they kind of roll over. So the ones that you get this uh, league summit, they will be good for three years after that date. So it will keep you kind of on top of your CEU game so that you're not having to scramble the last minute. Uh, the other is November 30th, which oh. is the last day to register teams. And no, I have Harvard. a question. Yeah, yeah it's Ben Harbor. Do y'all have the agenda set and to be able to, to send out for that event, the League Summit? We are working on it, and we should have that after uh, this Wednesday. So all coach oh. supporters, we have a standing call on Wednesdays bi-weekly. Wow. And this, uh, when we are kind of wrapping up um, blurbs and things like that, and we'll be getting out a um, agenda so that everyone can see what we're doing. The one thing that I want to make sure everyone's clear on is that the League Summit is different from the Leaders Summit. Leader Summit is a level three uh, coaching requirement, just that one time attendance at a level at a leader summit. And because Nike National does those online, we have 
let them take the lift on the leader summit so that our league summit can be things that we kind of tailor make for ourselves and not have to just run through the canned curriculum that they run through on the leader summit. That way it's something that if you've been to um, any type of big league event before, it's all fresh content. So it's nothing that's going to be repetitive and um, not worth your while to attend. November 30th is the last day to register teams. Um, after November 30th, there will be no more new team registration. Um, so the league summit does not count towards level three. That is correct. Leaders summit is what is required for um, level three. And that is why we don't call it a leader summit. We call it a league summit to be specific. December 1st is gonna be the first day of the regular season. And then January 31st is going to be the last day for student athletes to register. Um, if you haven't submitted your team proposal for 2023, as of right now, I think I'm around uh, 20 uh, more teams registered than have uh, submitted team proposals. If you can do that as quickly as possible, and the link to that is there as well, so that you can fill that out. If you'll take the time to fill one out for each team that you're involved in. So if you have separate entities in pit zone, if you'll fill out one for each one of those separate entities, that would be great. Are there any questions on those dates and the information that's needed? You may cover this later, but when can we expect uh, insurance certificates and, and the go ahead to start the preseason events? Uh, that's a great question. And so Brian has been in contact with NICA. That is strictly a NICA thing. Um, so NICA, I mean, excuse me, Brian, do you have any uh, more information that you got on that today? I, I do not. I asked a couple times to a couple different people there and I'll, we'll get that information out as soon as we can. And the, just as a reminder, because uh, I don't remember, the preseason events can be held, no more than six, have to be approved, but is there a certain date range that's considered preseason since our, if, if we're already into like mid-October and the season starts December 1, I would assume all the preseason events need to fit in that window, is that correct? Correct. October 15th to November 30th is preseason. And then after that, there is no submitting for approval or anything like that. You're in regular season and you can do your uh, practices and um, any other type of uh, things that you're doing, like mechanic nights at shops, um, any sort of team thing that you're doing, you're fine as long as you're in regular season. Thanks, Sean, for, for you and those that have been around the league uh, just slightly longer than I have, when do we usually see insurance for teams at this point in the season? That's a great question. Um, it's, it's never really right at the very beginning of student athlete registration for whatever reason. So it does take a little bit of a lag. Um, to my knowledge, it's never been something that we had to wait on um, in order to do our preseason events, sort of like our preseason events are kind of covered. Um, and then as far as um, Itza is asking about the team proposal, uh, whether or not your team has been approved. So really, to be honest, it's not so much a, an approval process. It really is just about getting all of that information down in a general form so that we've got that to touch base on. And it's one thing that we're kind of going to go back on and look at, are there teams that are sort of overlapping um, in what schools or, or places that they think that they kind of have jurisdiction on? And just a way of kind of looking at that, looking at your general philosophy and plans and that sort of thing. So it's not really like we're gonna say, no, you can't have a team. It really is just about getting all of that information so that we have that to take a look at. Um, at this point, you know, Everyone's getting registered, student athletes are getting registered, you're filing your, um, your preseason event forms, everything's going smoothly. There's nothing really at this point that we're going to be like, hold on, this is a, a red light or anything like that. Just keep working the way you are. Everyone does a really good job. And so it's not anything that we really feel like we need to um, be kind of watching over you or anything like that. We just want to have all of this information for us to look at and make sure that we don't have any discrepancies or conflicts. And, and just to be clear, we cannot do any preseason events till we have an insurance certificate in hand, correct? Um, that we're gonna follow up and make sure on. Um, 
in the past, I've never, I've never been in a position to where um, this was the issue that it is right now. And so we're kind of at a point that we need to get a little bit of guidance from NICA before we move forward. I've had multiple uh, teams reach out to me and just say, hey, I don't have any insurance. Uh, none of us do. Um, none of our teams have that insurance at all says pending. My, um, my concern is like what timeline is NICA kind of operating on to get that set up? And if we can get some guidance from them as to um, don't worry about that, go ahead and have preseason events. That's more about the regular season. Then we'll communicate that with you ASAP. Thanks, Thanks John. John. This is this is Brian again. I'll get on the phone with National in the morning and get us an answer on the way ahead. Okay. Hey, um, hey Brian. Sorry, Sean. To answer your question yeah. previously, um, mm -hmm. I just looked at my uh, insurance certificate from last year, and it was dated 20 October. Okay. So if if you have everything done and and everything is good in your registration, it should come by the end of the month, I would say. Just guessing. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, your question, um, if you have a approved team proposal, do you need to email a small details change? Um, an example would be that our first fun ride this coming Saturday is moving meeting location to Whitewater Middle School instead of Whitewater Elementary. Um, you know, you can you can just email me and just let me know that bring that to my attention so that there's a change um and and we're fine with that that's okay but you don't need to refill out all that paperwork but just to be clear one more time she can't have that event unless she has a certificate and the only reason i'm asking is we have a saturday event planned and i'm telling people if we don't have an, a certificate there's going to be no saturday event um at this point the the most realistic answer that i can give you is to err on the side of caution and say no that that certificate is going to need to be in place but brian is going to follow up with micah okay. tomorrow to get more guidance on that and we will let you know asap cool thank you no problem i i definitely understand the predicament that you're in and we will get that information out as quickly as possible hey sean jeff leblanc here yes jeff yeah normally we start our preseason. we do classes I, i'm taking it that Classroom session stuffs aren't an issue at all. We generally do classes on code of conduct. We do a little bike maintenance. So we do indoor classes. Nobody's on a bike yet. And generally come November, uh, when we usually have had insurance by then, that's when the planning goes in for these, you know, come see what mountain biking is all about and that sort of thing. So we don't even put them near a bike except to look at one for bike maintenance. But generally we just hold classroom sessions uh, in this October time frame leading into November and save all the, we're going to do a family fun ride type stuff until we know we have insurance. So I'm taking it that that's not an issue. And that's generally the way we do it is do classroom stuff, get them ready to get on the bike and don't do anything on the bike until you have that insurance in hand. And that's what I've done in the past. Yeah. Unless you're like, you know, battling uh, bike mechanics with tools and, and using chain rings as ninja stars, I think you're okay on that. Um, and then it would just be mainly the need for the certificate of insurance for doing actual on bike stuff would be my, my feelings on that. But that's my feelings. Um, as I said, Brian's on it, he'll get more guidance and we will get that out to you as quickly as possible. Hey, Sean, Kevin Vanover. Um, mm -hmm. so any, any preseason type like ride events, they we've got to have a form filled out and approved by the by the league you, any preseason activity and activities can include those bike maintenance days shop visits um things like that that are whole team activity with coaches um but are kind of in the bike space so if it's a um bike maintenance uh, clinic, if it is a um, team building exercise, anything like that, you're gonna want to put in the preseason activity approval form for that. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So I've linked um, all those preseason forms here. So there's the preseason activity approval form. Um, unfortunately, it has space for five events, um, not a sixth. So if you're doing six, you can go ahead and um, just email me 
um, that sixth event and let me know the details on that. Um, there is nowhere in pit zone that shows you if the team proposal has been submitted. That is purely a North Carolina league thing. So it doesn't go in pit zone at all. It is just that form. Um, and I can, you know, I can let you know if, if uh, there isn't one, um, just e reach out to me and just ask if one has been submitted by you. And I can double check on that. Um, how much notice is needed to get approval for a preseason event? Um, Really, just a couple of days. Um, honestly, I haven't even gotten to looking at any of the preseason activity approval forms yet because I've been inundated with everything with um, pit zone. So I've been trying to get all of that stuff taken care of before I have even taken a look at preseason activities. Um, and I'll be addressing those here uh, this week, knowing that a lot of people are gearing up for this weekend. Um, So uh, one thing that um, you do need to be aware of is that you, if you do hold an event without a certificate of insurance, uh, you are potentially liable if there's a, an abusive allegation uh, since that's covered under the insurance. So just something that um, was brought up by our programs director. All right, a um, couple things. Uh, so TeamSnap, uh, we have had uh, about 38 or 58 registered teams are, are in Team Snap now. And if you don't currently have a Team Snap account for your team, you can fill out the Team Snap information form and I'll create one for you. If you have a Team Snap account that you're currently using with your team, you can fill out this Team Snap transfer form and then it will be transferred into the league. If you have an annual subscription, then the prorated amount of your annual subscription that you have not used will be refunded to you since the league is covering the bill for that. Um, so those two things, if you can do that um, as soon as possible, that team snap transfer form is going to go extinct at the end of October. It has a 30 day window. So if you are wanting to have that team snap account transferred over, that's going to be the time frame that you need to get that done in. As of November 1st, what I'll do is kind of go in and any team that doesn't have a team snap account, I will create one for you and I'll just make the team director, the account owner. If um, you want something different, please fill out that team snap information form. One of the nice things about if you have a single team account, for instance, I have one team account with uh, my composite team, but I just had all of my student athletes from the multiple teams that I have in that account. Whenever I had that ported over and then created three new team snap accounts under my ownership, I now have four teams, but I can add student athletes from my existing team that I already had to the new team that they're on and they stay in both places. So if you want one place to do all of your communication, but you want each student athlete to be on their separate team for purposes of like paying dues payments or maybe doing attendance at um, practices for purposes of keeping track of the designated, uh, excuse me, the um, designated reporter reports that have to go out then you can do that and, and it all plays very well. So there's no problems. And there is no loss of information, no anything like that. Um, there was some reports of that early on and it was just weird fluky things that um, the servers had not quite updated yet, but there is no loss of information and everything is there. So all of your stuff is perfectly safe, transferring from where it's at now into the league team stuff. In addition to all of that, there is the um, petition for category placement exception form. We've already had several people wanting to reach out and discuss like what category they're gonna be racing. Everything needs to be done through that category placement exception form. Um, and that needs to be filled out by the head coaches. And then the lunar bike application and the student athlete scholarship application, both of those are there and they should really be filled out by the head coach or team director as well on behalf of the student athlete and their parents. Um, hmm. Caroline, what's your question about TeamSnap? So we've been using TeamSnap for four years now. Mm -hmm. um, and 
routinely the students in the off season have used the chat feature to say, mm -hmm. Hey, we're going riding. Anybody want to go? Mm -hmm. um, and some of the coaches will go as a person, not as a coach. Mm -hmm. um, Cause our kids are on the team and everything. And we all meet up and just go ride. Mm -hmm. um, can we still do that? Seeing as that is now an official league. Like communication tool now. The right. official the official league part of this is really just we wanted to provide this to you for free. That okay. was the impetus. This was not like we're now going to lord over you with a draconian fist. That it was literally like we can pay a really reasonable price. The amount of money that we're paying for the league is when when I knew how much I was paying as a team, and then I saw how much we could do the league for, it was only four times more for Oof. the league the league to provide it to everyone than it was for me to pay for it for my one team so fantastic. and and not just that it's the ultra it's like all the bells and whistles so it just made absolute financial sense on our end to just like we're just going to provide this for everybody so that they don't have to keep scrambling and, and coming up with this money this is an easy lift for us um and okay. so that's what we wanted to do the nice wow. thing is that now I can go in and I can create like all of the um, race events and Shell is, is creating grid events and, and other future program events. And we're tagging like the directions and things like that. So all the parents will have it. They'll just be able to open up the app, hit this is where I'm going. Here's where I'm leaving from. And it'll just do the directions in Google Maps and take them right there. So no more like coordinating travel and all that sort of stuff. So okay. we're trying to be as proactive as possible. On this well, thing. I only ask because I'm a rule follower and in the rules, it says that you can't organize any rides with team communications like that you're using. And like we've been using Team Snap for four years. So we're like, oh, what does that mean? Does that mean we can't in the summertime just say, hey, I'm going riding at Whitewater. Anybody want to go? You know, that so kind of like I, I totally understand wh where you're coming from and I'm the same way. I don't like rules that we then say, well, we don't have to follow this rule, but um, essentially what it is, is as long as it is student generated, student athlete generated, I really um, think that that's just them using the means of communication under the watchful eye of responsible adults to organize this stuff. And I think that's perfectly reasonable. Mm -hmm. So that's nothing that we're going to like have issues with um you're not organizing practices or anything like that you're not trying to do any of that stuff so no you know, but what, it's what i okay. mean i mean i go riding and i like to go with somebody so i ask so yeah. it's not always student driven you know sometimes it is a coach saying hey i'm going to ride and sometimes he's asking other coaches like hey i'm yeah. going for riding. anybody want to go with me and so i, think that's I just want to make sure we're not gonna break any rules <laughs> no as long as you're not like, okay, here's the training uh, schedule for this no. week. I think you're fine. It's, no, hey, it's just uh, social rides. Hey, Car yeah. Carolyn, Br Brian Russell here. Th thanks for the question. Thanks for being sensitive to that. Uh, agree with everything Sean said here. You're thinking the right way about it. Uh, we, Sean and I have a session with Chris Molesky at National tomorrow night on Team Snap. And that's one of the questions I'm going to ask if there's any uh, best practices, lessons learned about appropriate communication between leadership and student athletes that we just need to be aware of. It might be a new tool for, for some of us in the league. So I think those are good questions to bring up, Carolyn. I just wanted to thank you for, for asking it here. Okay, definitely. Um, and then let's see, there were a couple of questions coming through. Um, Aubrey, is there a deadline for learner bike and scholarship application forms? If so, when? Um, not especially. Um, I mean, scholarship application forms, obviously, you need to have that in because a student athlete can't practice with you until um, their fees are paid. Um, so that's just before they can actually participate with your team. And then um the deadline for learner bikes we we're trying to make a single order or or things like that just to make sure that we're we've got a lot covered um we're gonna kind of maybe buy some bikes uh without really knowing any applications yet just because i know what sizes we're kind of light on and kind of fill from there so that's really going to be kind of the sooner the better uh, one thing that I'm really concerned about, and this is from my own personal experience on my teams, is I have had a really bad track record of 
uh, student athletes that get granted scholarships and get loaner bikes um, actually finishing a season, um, actually even lasting more than a month in the season. And that's a bit of a bummer. Um, and that's one thing that I think I'd like for all of you to be really aware of is that um, the student athlete scholarship is not a North Carolina just going, yeah, we don't, we won't take any fees from this. North Carolina actually will um, not get the fees that would come to it, but then will pay the money out of its general fund to Nike National to cover that student athlete's fee to Nike National. So it is sort of a, a, a cost to the league. And then loaner bikes, we do purchase those. And if a, if a student athlete gets a loaner bike and, and we've purchased it and then they kind of leave and then we've got a bike and the bike kind of doesn't have anybody to ride it for the rest of the season, that's another sort of outlay of, of money that maybe um, didn't need to occur. It's not to, not to dissuade anyone from, from filling out those applications, but definitely something just to be aware of. Um, and I wrestle with how to best address this. It just seems like sometimes student athletes and parents, if they have no skin in the game, it's very easy for them to just walk away. Um, and that's kind of a dis disappointing thing, you know, personally that I've had to experience and let alone knowing kind of other things. Um, I, I had a student athlete last year that actually applied for a scholarship, got it, and I didn't even know they applied. And I knew the whole time that they were actually moving out of state to West Virginia. And they, they took the scholarship, registered the student athlete, and then literally never showed up for practice. And they were gone to West Virginia within a month. So just kind of keep that in, in, in your mind whenever you are talking about these scholarships and loaner bike applications, just to make sure that you really are trying to get a, a student athlete that really has a genuine interest to, to participate and isn't just sort of like, oh, I'll just try this and see how it goes kind of thing. Um, that, that I think has kind of been my mistake in the past. All right. Um, so there's a couple of questions about uh, category placements. Um, and so what I'll do is I will direct you to the um, rule book. It's page 120 to 122 in the 2022 NICA handbook. And I, um, I believe I sent an email out that had that link to it. Um, and that specifies the criteria that we go by. And so if there's anything that a student athlete uh, needs to either upgrade to a category that they aren't automatically placed in, or needs to downgrade from a category that they have been automatically placed in, then those would be the um, petition for exception forms that need to be filed so that we can go through those. All right. Um, are there other questions that that doesn't cover? Sean, this is uh, Matt. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, we, uh, we've had some questions about, um, <sighs> I'm just going to come out and say it's sandbagging. Um, what we might consider sandbagging or the kids are considering sandbagging um, in JV2, JV1, varsity. Um, there were several instances apparently last year where uh, uh, several JV2 riders would have made varsity podium. Um, we're having some morale issues because of issues like that and willingness to participate. They're like, why bother? Um, if they're really putting in their level best effort in the category that they feel that they belong in, but there are other people that are way outperforming the category that they're in. Is there any, are there any provisions for moving them mid season or saying, okay, you're just blowing everybody out of the water. You need to upgrade. I know it's been encouraged and it's just been a, uh, I think in the past, it's just been, you know, a recommendation that, Hey, you really ought to consider this. It's starting to affect some of our kids. Um, so is there, what what can we do about that? Um, so under the current structure that NICA provides us, um, 
I don't know what exactly we can do about that. That's going to be something that we'll need to sit down and take a look at and see what we can do. One of the things to be aware of is that uh, that rule book is the rule book for the season. And so once, once that rule book is released, there's no changing rules at that point. Uh, we actually, I have to file rule change um, applications at the end of June for the very next season. So uh, I think that committee is actually having a final meeting on rule changes that were submitted in June 30 for the new uh, rule book that will be coming out for this season. Um, so we can look at it and see what it is that we can do within the rules to encourage, um, kind of fair competition. And then maybe we need to sit down and take a look at how do we tweak the rules for North Carolina to make this, um, less of an issue, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I've got kids that are saying, I don't want to do this. I want to go back to the next level and they're going to blow those kids out of the water. Um, yeah, you know, and well, I understand their position. Um, and I know it's all about, you know, we, we try to tell them, well, you just got to do your level best, but you know, they're seeing other kids on the podium, walking, walking away with hardware and they're just really frustrated because they're working really hard. Um, so it's a discouraging thing for them. So yeah, do what you can do, see what you can you know, put together. I don't think we're the only ones that are having this issue. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a, a pretty broad based thing. So, um, I think that's next, uh, next step on some agenda to figure something out there, like, you know, automatic upgrades or something. I, I don't know. Now, um, one, one thing that I'm, um, proposing and uh, it's not been approved or anything like that. So I can just kind of share it with you and, and get your feedback on it is actually um, running two different uh, team competitions. So running a team competition for composite teams and running a team competition for school-based teams. Uh, and looking at results, um, school-based teams were shut out, especially at the middle school level from um, even like the top five in team competitions at most races last season. And that is one way that possibly we could give a little bit more competitiveness for those school-based teams that are typically smaller and just draw from a, a smaller pool of, of riders to contribute to that team score. Um, I don't know what you all think about that. You're more than welcome to email me and just let me know your thoughts. Um, but just one of those things that we're kind of maybe thinking about to try and encourage more student athletes that aren't seeing the success that they, that they should. Hey, Sean, Jeff LeBlanc here. Yes. Just yes. Not to go too deep into this. I'm sure we'll have some more discussions possibly even at the league summit, but I know that what, you know, Matt's been talking about is, is an ongoing situation. And one of the biggest deterrences of a coach or even a student to cat up a student is they lose all the points from that race. They move up with a zero. And one of the one of the conversations we had in the past was, you know, you could at least give them last place points for the category they're moving up into. So instead of moving up with a zero, they move up with something because you do a race and yeah, you blow somebody out of the water, but the student had no idea that that's where they were gonna be. And they say, well, cat up. Well, if you cat up, you cat up with a zero. You're now you're suddenly, you know, last in the call up list. And so there's such a disadvantage to cat up. And if we could solve some of those problems, and if it needs to be in the rule book, then it's great. But if you solve a problem where it's not such a, a detriment to cat up uh, with points and with call up, you know, positioning or that sort of thing, I think you'd find a whole lot more coaches and students saying, absolutely, let's move up because I'm not losing everything because I did great in this race, but I might as well have not have been there at all because you take everything away if I cat up. So last season, we did do that. Last season, we um, gave them last place points when they catted up. Um, so if they raced the first race and catted up the second race, then they got the last place points um, for that second race to get a call up. Um, one thing that uh, I'm working on and that hasn't been approved yet is another way for us to 
kind of mitigate um, those races with uh, call-ups so that we can um, get those kids up to the front uh, a little faster. And um, once we have kind of approval from the league, then I'll be able to share that with you. Uh, so there's a couple of things that we're thinking of to try and, and address those issues. But last year we did do the last place and I think that'll help. And then I've got one more, um, one more thing that I think will kind of help push it over the top to make it a little bit more equitable for those kids to move up. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Hey, Sean, the last place call up points, is that something that happened only after like the first race or could that have been like in the middle of the season or just um, anywhere? Yeah. So uh, realistically, the um, the way the cat up works is it only makes sense if the rider is trying to be competitive in the overall to cat up um, from the first race, because then that first race ends up being their drop and then they've got four races to sort of set themselves up um for the overall then if they do it in the mid-season then they're gonna have you know one drop and then a, and you know like zero points a last place and so it's they're not going to be competitive for the overall but they're at least in a in a more competitive class for themselves um i'm also working on for the um the state championships, like how that sort of selection criteria is going to work out. And this is a good point to think about, like if a, if a kid does uh, cut up during the season before state championships, like what's realistically the, the path for them to qualify for, for state championships kind of thing. And so that's, that's a good one um, for me to kind of make note of, because that's one that I hadn't thought of. So thanks. I'm just going to throw it out there real quick that because there is a state championship, mm -hmm. the uh, <laughs> there's going to be a, uh, much more emphasis on points and positioning and categories, and you, you're you're going to be <laughs> in for a whole lot of uh, oh yeah oh yeah yeah a whole lot of issues oh yeah I know um, it's like uh, homecoming court in high school um yeah. there's no right way and i'm used to i'm never right and um like i'll be honest with you if half of you like the the things that i say and, and only half of you um have severe issues with it i'm doing pretty good um so i'm kind of used to that but we do our best and um this first eight championships i'll be honest we're probably going to screw something up and somebody's going to get mad and somebody's going to get hurt. And, you know, I've, I'm probably going to get yelled at by a parent will not be the first time and it will not be the last time, but um, you know, we're doing our best and we will continue to do our best and we will always refine and try to make things better. Like that's the key is everything is a learning experience for us. and We'll just continue to make it better. So this is going to be our first stab at a state championships. And we're really trying to be thoughtful and mindful about how we do it and um we're going to do our best but uh full knowledge and full warning fair warning that uh we're not going to get it 100 percent right i'm sure i'm positive um so hopefully uh it will be someone that um i know well and like and respect that comes and yells at me because that'll be marginally easier for me to take um all right so Hey, Sean, one more uh, question on, on cat up here, Je Jeff here. Just a quick question. What's the cutoff yeah. date to cat somebody up so that at the first race, their race plate is for that category with their name on it and everything? Uh, that usually is a Heike Biller question. And I believe it is two weeks before. No, it's more than that. It's usually in February sometime. Yeah, I think, I, I think it's like first week in february maybe second week in february hey, i'll hey, get sean, you an exact sean, i'll get yeah, you an exact sean, date Bri from there. sean yeah. brian here that's one of our yeah. topics for the uh, league director call first monday of november uh to uh, set that date for everyone so we yeah. i think we're doing we're thinking about doing it a little bit earlier based on last year 
Um, but yeah, we'll get that word out probably next month to everybody. Cool. All right. A um, couple of quick things, uh, especially for team directors and head coaches that I just want to make you aware of. So um, I'm going to run through this pretty quick, but it's important stuff. So here is uh, one of my teams, and um, this is from last year. This is not um, from this year, uh, which is why a lot of the um, coaches are actually registered. I don't have this many coaches registered currently. Um, but uh, things to watch out for, green checks, great. Red exclamation point, bad. Um, so if you see a coach with a red exclamation point and then you see them in person at practice, the thing that you need to do is walk up to that coach and say, really glad you can make it, but you can't be here until you are fully registered in pizza. And when that coach says, I thought I was fully registered. If you hover on that exclamation point, it will tell you everything that that coach needs to complete in order to be fully registered. So be very proactive, be, be kind, be courteous, but do not waver on letting that person be with you at practice. Um, especially returning coaches, they know. They know this is what they need to do. And they will say, I, totally sorry, I'll get right on that. Um, and so what I do is try to be proactive and leading up to activities or practices, I email those coaches and go, hey, I need you to take care of this, 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 and this. In order to be able to help us out, we could really use your help. So couch it in terms of, I really need you and I just need you to take care of this so that you can be a part of what it is that we're doing. And they will be more than happy to comply in my, in my um, experience. The other thing is to make sure that you are aware of everyone's license level so that you have them participating in your team at the appropriate role for their license. And then last but not least, um, so this is an interesting situation that started to occur last year. And um, it's one that this coach was until this date, a level three coach. Um, and so they lapsed and, or excuse me, they were a level two coach and they lapsed. And not only were they no longer level two, which meant they can no longer lead rides, they were no longer level anything, which meant that they could no longer participate in practices. Um, this was a coach that actually I kept seeing at races and kept having conversations with. And um, I don't think ever got their license right um, for the season after this date um, and was fully participating in practices. This is team director 101 stuff right here. This is something that you really need to be aware of. You can see this for every one of your coaches whenever you click the license status. So click on the coach and click their license status and you can see all of this um, and you can see exactly what they need to do. So can anyone tell me right now what this coach could do in order to be able to participate in practice at any level? One. Yeah, Jeff here, all he has to do is complete the coach's license level one class and becomes a level one coach and he's back at it again. Jeff LeBlanc, everybody, give him a big round of applause. I did not have to pay him for that mm -hmm. answer. Yes, yes. That's all he had to do was just get right with that training. Now, the cool thing is, is that that would bring him to level one, but also because his highest level of um, license the year before was level two, he would get two CEUs for doing that training also. So it would bring him current. And then once he did his first aid and CPR certification, he would be able to submit that completion of certifi certificate for CEUs. So there's a lot of upside to this. Um, but definitely be having these conversations with your coaches. It's very, 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 very important that you do that. Sean, Don so, Rose here from East Chapel Hill. Yes, Don. Just to... A point about the CEUs, it's, it's a little tricky, and I got caught in this trap where if you're a first-time CEU attainer, you don't know how many CEUs you have to get 
to get to your nine or your three or whatever it is, it's not clear from, and it's not clear that's a deficiency. Uh, when you start earning CEUs, you know when they expire and you can kind of start doing your math, but I've, NICA has already uh, admitted that this is a real problem in pit zone. So the, what it tells you is that you have to have that every three years. So it's that third year of being level two or level three that that kicks in. And it does tell you how many CEUs you have. If you look here by the CEUs, like this person has seven units and it tells you when they expire. So it will tell you the number of units that they have and let you know um, kind of the expirations on them. And then you can kind of keep putting CEUs in there. And there's lots of things that are acceptable for CEUs. It doesn't have to be NICA things. There are online trainings that you can do through um, USAC, through the um, uh, National um, Federation of High School Sports, like all kinds of places that you can do. Um, if you get uh, private instruction from some um, somebody who's like a PMBIA certified coach or a um, BICP certified coach. If you attend a clinic by someone like Ninja, Mountain Bike, any of those things, you can submit that for your CEUs because all of that is going towards you being a better rider and a, and a better coach. So there's lots of things kind of outside the box that you can that you can apply for to submit for CEUs. You just need some sort of certificate. And a lot of places they may not give you one, but if you ask and say, hey, I need to submit this for CEUs for NICA, they're more than agreeable to uh, provide that for you. Um, just some yeah, proof no. that you did something. Yeah, that's that's fine. Just as a if you're if you haven't accumulated any CEUs prior to X to needing CEUs, you won't know that because it won't show you don't have anything to expire. And so you just don't know that. And so if you're a first time coach trying to accumulate CEUs, you, you need to just be careful. You don't get caught in the trap of I need nine all of a sudden, like I did to maintain my, my level three. And I had no yep. idea until you told me I had to get them. So I got them, but it's just a little bit of a trap. You need to be careful of it. And it'll say that you're a level none coach, even though all the green boxes are checked because hidden in there are the CEU requirements that don't say that you need them. So to be clear on, on the NICA requirement, so every three years as a level two licensed coach, you need three CEUs. Every three years as a NICA level three licensed coach, you need nine CEUs. If you are level two one year and then you are level three two years, then that is your third year as a level three and you need nine. So it's kind of the combination. So it's whatever your highest level is at the end of that three year period that you need to be getting those CEUs. Um, after that, um, you will have this kind of nice little readout until everything expires. And once everything expires, it will just be a, back at zero. And you'll kind of be in the same boat again of like, oh, wow, I didn't know I needed nine CEUs again. Um, and that's e an easy one to fall into kind of something to sort of do ongoing maintenance wise is as a level three coach, as soon as you see the opportunity to take level one or level two certification training, go ahead and take it. The level one is good for two CEUs and the level two is good for four CEUs. There is uh, this season, a NICA adventure coach module that is in the LMS and that is good for two CEUs. So right there with those three trainings, you can get eight. Um, and then you just need one additional. And then um, hopefully now that we're post pandemic, we will be having these league summits every year. And that will be another opportunity for you to get a uh, nice chunk of CEUs. Uh, you can also um, take OTBS 101 again. You can take OTBS 201 when we offer that in order to get CEUs. So there, there will be a lot of things in the league level we'll be able to offer for CEUs as well that I would encourage you to look at whenever those become available. Um, but yes, Don, you're, you're correct. You do not want to get caught in that, like, oh no, now I've got to get this. Because um, it, it is an easy one to, uh, to oversee for sure. All right. Um, so 
that's kind of that. And then the only other thing that I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of is whenever you're looking as a team director, this is sort of job number one, uh, one A and one B. So one A is making sure your coaches are good for, for practice. And one B is making sure that your student athletes are practice ready. And the color of this really doesn't mean anything. So you can see that no here is in gray and no here is in black. That doesn't mean anything. What we're looking for is yes. So when you see practice ready, yes, the student athlete can come to practice, can come to preseason events, all of that, they are ready to go um, and all good. In preseason, you can have a new student athlete to your team, not new for the season, but new for that team, um, new to NICA. They can participate one time with your team on a student waiver, the same thing with an adult. A returning coach that isn't right yet, they cannot participate on that waiver. They have to be right. Um, it's just the one time um, per lifetime that you can use that waiver for either an adult or a student athlete to participate with the team. Be aware that any adult that is participating with a team for that one time waiver has to be accompanied by a um, level two or level three coach at all times. And they cannot be in any one on one situation with any student athletes at all. So those two things have to be, um, you have to be very vigilant on as well. Um, it's designed so that a person can sort of see what the team is all about um, and participate that way and learn more about your team culture and see if it's for them. Um, but you don't want them directly interacting with your student athletes. They have no training and um, no reason to be doing that. They should be there strictly to observe. Questions on that? All right, uh, we have five new teams that have joined the league so far this season. That means that we will have additional OTBS 101 courses. Uh, we're gonna work with those new teams to schedule them. Um, I will tell you that one of those will be in Lenore because one of the new teams is mine. Um, and any seats that are in the class that aren't filled by the team will open up to the league. And we really want those to be taken by returning level one coaches. Um, if it's someone that's returning as a level one, they've obviously shown commitment to your team. They get your team culture. And now that uh, OTBS 101 training will help them on their path to level two and being a greater asset for your team. So that's really what we're trying to encourage. Questions on that? Will there be any more 201 trainings anytime between now and beginning of the season or some? Uh, not that I anticipate, uh, simply because 201s are not a requirement for anything. They are just CEUs. And um, right now, I am the only coach supporter that is certified to, to teach 201. Uh, that's one of the things that we're looking to address in the offseason um, next year in order to get more coach supporters that can teach 201 so that we can continue with the team teaching model. Um, but as of right now, I don't anticipate having any 201s on um, this season. Thanks. No problem. Thank you. All right. And um, last but not least, uh, the program's uh, kind of spotlight. And um, Shell, do you want to speak to this while you have everyone on the call? So we have not a lot of time to get student athletes and coaches registered for these. So um, my focus would be on that first one at Dark Mountain on October 29th. We actually currently only have three coaches signed up um, as volunteers for that. So we could really use some help. Um, we have about 51, I think, female coaches currently registered. Um, if any are available to come and support, we could really use the help for that. Um, there's another one the very next week um, in Hollister, North Carolina. So we could really use people signing up to support those and getting the word out to student athletes to get registered in pit zone so they can participate in these. Um, each one is gonna have a different theme. They should be 
a lot of fun. They were a pretty big hit last year um, and a great way for female student athletes, especially new ones, but also returning ones to get connected with our bigger community of female student athletes in the league um, and kind of gave them some new friends and connections to look forward to um, going into race season. Um, so it is a really great opportunity if you can get your female student athletes even just to come attend one. Um, got a question. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, I was asked uh, yesterday by, a, uh, uh, by Skylar, um, she has a, uh, prospective student athlete, female student athlete, and who's pretty shy. She thinks that the, uh, the grit, uh, one of the preseason grit programs would be probably the best introduction to NICA for her. Um, but she was asking about the, the waivers and, um, if she was able to sign a one-time waiver to attend your grit event, and then if, for our team event, we're going to have future interest meetings. If she would be allowed to also participate and show up to that interest event to make sure that we are a fit as a team for her. But she feels that the GRIT program is going to be the best introduction and best possibility of uh, uh, grabbing her and, you know, holding on. Opinions, thoughts, what do we do? So unfortunately, like I, I can totally understand the appeal of being able to participate with a waiver in grit events. Um, but unfortunately, they're not such a feasible um, opportunity at league level events. Um, they're more of a opportunity that's realistic and manageable on the team level. The reason being that if we allow waivers, um, we have to allow waivers for anyone that wants to use one, um, which would obviously really increase the number of, in, of participants. Um, but the problem being, we would have no way to manage um, the coach to student athlete ratios, who would be showing up, who would be signing up. And that would also usually bring in a lot larger number of completely inexperienced student athletes, um, which when it's a manageable level and we know how many to expect, um, we can prepare for, but when using waivers, we can get a really high number and that can be really problematic um, to manage on at a league level. So it's also combining at a league event coaches with student athletes that they're not familiar with, which kind of makes things more complicated in an event like that. So it's just not a feasible solution for league level events. Um, so I definitely suggest using it for the team level events. Okay, understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, the only other things I've got is we have applications for new grit ambassadors that are open right now and the applications for those will be closing on October 22nd um, and student athletes do have to be fully registered in pit zone in order to apply and applications for the grit mentor program are currently open. We will leave those open until February 1st, which is the day after student athlete registration closes or when we hit capacity. Um, if you have a new student athlete, um, this is open to any first year female student athletes of any grade level um, or skill level, as long as it's their first year in the league. Um, I would really strongly recommend getting them connected um, in the GRIT mentor program because we've had really good results of already being seen in pit zone of student athletes returning for a second year um, at much higher percentages than we have in the past. So. That's a really great opportunity for them to build some really strong connections within the league. So, All right. And just looking at the chat, just a couple of things to bring up that maybe uh, didn't get uh, some, some light of day. So uh, Heike said that, remember, the, just a reminder that last year was an odd year because uh, student athletes were placed in categories based on results from the only race we held two seasons prior. Um, so this year's category placements were based on last year's race results. So there should be a little bit better kind of fit. Um, then uh, Julie Daniels, will the league be adding CEUs so that our coaches can get up to the next level without seeking paying for lots of outside courses? So there's eight that you can get within NICA for free. 
um, the level one, the level two, and the adventure, and then that leaves one CEU for you. The league uh, is providing the eight CEU trainings at uh, the league summit. Um, and then there's other outside places that you can get um, free wins. There is a uh, link on um, the coaches resources that has a link to some other CEU opportunities that you can look at. Uh, there's lots of stuff out there. Um, you, USA Cycling has a coach training uh, page and there's lots of CEU opportunities there. Some of them cost money, but others are not, they're free um, and they're online and you can, you can go through them pretty quickly and easily. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, yes, Bob Zarzecki. So if you're a level three coach, you got a email for the level three coach helmets that are coming from Trek Bontrager. So congratulations, the level three helmet is back. So if you have looked at Envy with coaches that have been level three for long periods of time, and didn't realize that those white, red, and blue, nice level three helmets that they had are six years old, um, but we're just looking at how cool they looked. You are now have the opportunity to get a totally brand new wave cell helmet from Bond Traeger uh, that is the Nike coloration, which is pretty awesome. I have a question about that, Sean. Yes. This is Matt. Um, yes. Okay, so yeah, my helmet is, you know, pretty old um recommendation is to you know swap them every two years um i didn't want to double dip but could i Whoa, wait a second what bike shop know, are you going to that they're telling you you got to get a new helmet every two years well it's not not if you look at the label on the helmet a lot of them say you know two years cert certification or whatever so that uh, was always now i've got helmets that are 10 years old myself <laughs> um <clears throat> Would it be kosher to double dip if you already have one? If they sent you the would it email, be considered double dipping? No, uh, they're providing it for okay. all level three coaches. If they if they sent you the the email form, you need to get the new helmet. I mean, plain Got and simple. It. Yep, awesome. Yep. Hey, hey Matt, with that thinking, I'm going to tell my wife I need a bike, a new bike every two years, and so that yeah. ought to work too, right? Yeah, when they get exposed to the sun for two years, then they're no good anymore, and you got to get a new one. I like that. Um, uh, good that <laughs> so uh jim otto um what about opportunities for middle school racers to race high school based on lap times there's a middle schooler who would be competitive in varsity so as um i said earlier all of those guidelines are laid out in the rule book um and it sounds like what we're going to need to do is probably have a conversation about some sort of rule change for next season but for now we've got to work within that rule book um and do what we can to sort of accommodate everyone and let's see uh my wife has chimed in and said that she had no ceus last year and did them online for free through nica and other partner organizations it was a lot of seat time but she got through it so i think she did that in a weekend um when she saw that that she needed it and uh, Caroline Prey for Shell for future planning purposes, um, not able to help this year at all of the grid events. Um, Saturdays are always a day for our team rides events. And this year due to team coach numbers, they need me to be there. But being next season grid events may be able to happen on Sundays. Maybe I do realize scheduling is really hard and never works for everyone. So I may just be out of luck. Um, as always, we, we try to do our best. Um, so, but thank you for sharing that. Does anyone have any other questions, concerns, or topics that they would like to bring up? I just want to say that the uh, the abuse training this year um, seems like it wasn't nearly as traumatic to me as it was in previous years. And I actually appreciate that because that was the thing that I was really not looking forward to participating in because um, it is a traumatic thing to uh, especially the way that they were presenting it the last time I did it. So I personally appreciate, a, you know, the emphasis, but the toning down of some of the issues there. So just so if you can pass, if you could pass that along. Um, that was a, a consistent critique that we were sharing with uh, coach licensing 
and they heard us and, and they, they turned it down. Um, I will tell you, I've been a professional educator for 22 years. I've sat through a lot of abuse trainings. Um, and the one that NICA had us do that very first round was by far the most traumatic experience of any of them that I've ever had. It, I sat down and I made the mistake of just sitting down and doing it all at once. Um, I think that was four hours and uh, I wasn't right for a week. So I appreciate that they have turned it down too. So, yeah, I, uh, I had the same, a little bit of the same reaction. So, yeah, I was just like, I'm just going to get through with this. I'm just going to get through with this and I don't have to deal with it anymore because I don't want this in my head. So, yes, absolutely. Awesome. Um, well, I apologize. I have kept you about 40 minutes late, but I really, really, really uh, appreciate all of your um, time and attention, some great questions. And as always, if you have any questions, concerns, or if you have a, uh, just a little thing that you can't quite figure out, email me, um, Sean at North Carolina MTB.org. And I will be as quickly responsive as I can be. And, um, I will get to you as soon as possible. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hey, Sean, this is Nikki Mallatin. Can I ask you hey, a quick Nikki. question? Yeah, what's up? Um, I did the um, one of these two-day modules for the PB Freshman Mountain Yeah, Bike. PBIA. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a certification, it was just a two-day module. And okay. I sent the league, um, they gave me an evaluation at the end. It wasn't a certificate because it wasn't a certificate class, but they rejected that. 